So, Professor Lam, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your introduction. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk with you about antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance in dairy cattle. And before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge some of my co-workers. Um, uh, Inge Sandman, Judith Keuring, Jeanette Heuvelink, and Michael Gronkheim, who really did the work that I'm presenting here today. I'm basically just following their work. Um, I start off with throwing some perspectives on antimicrobial use in cattle on you. First, there is the general public. They find that animal husbandry um, overuses antimicrobials, leading to problems in humans. And the main problems mentioned there are MRSA and, um, and ESBL. A second um, perspective, and then I talk from my own country, it differs per country, is the, the perspective of the authorities. In our country, it was so that based on the worries in the general public, something had to be done. And in 2009, our parliament decided that the animal, that the uh, antimicrobial use in, in animal husbandry had to be reduced by 70% within six years. The third one, the third perspective is that of the farmers and the veterinarians. And what was done in our country was that a task force was established, which basically had the approach that if there is a problem, it had to be solved and that antimicrobial use had to be decreased while preserving animal health and, um, and welfare. And then finally, and that's what I'm going to talk most about <coughs> with you today, is the perspective of the scientists. And our perspective is to monitor the problems, the activities, and the effects, and to, true that, to do that as much as possible evidence-based, and to publish that in scientific journals so that we can discuss about that um, together. The task force, the approach of the farmers and the veterinarians I've talked to you about two years ago at the, at the meeting in, uh, in Dublin. Um, uh, and I went into detail on what we did there to change the knowledge, attitude and behavior of farmers and veterinarians and everybody working in the field. And the, that we did that in cooperation between the different stakeholders in our, in our country. I went into detail about um, uh, uh, changing of behavior of, on the reset model that we introduced uh, and that we applied on antimicrobial use that goes on rules and regulations, education, social pressure, economic impulses and tools that can be used. We applied that on antimicrobial use and I'm not going to talk about that today. You can read it in the, in the Irish Veterinary Journal what we wrote about that. Bottom line was that we, that we were able to reduce antimicrobial use in our country, and I have to say this is in all animal species, not only in dairy, but we were, we, our country was successful in that. What I'd like to talk with you about today is the, the scientific, if you like, approach to, uh, to test the hypothesis or the idea in the general public whether or not um, the overuse of antimicrobials in animals and more specifically today in cattle, does lead to problems in, uh, in humans. Well, there is some reason for the public to believe that. If you look at MRSA and ESBL, and I'll mainly talk about ESBL this morning, um, the prevalence of MRSA in hospitalized people in the Netherlands was 0.03%, whereas it was 39% in pigs and 23% in pig farmers. So there's some reason to believe that there is a problem with MRSA in, um, in animals. Same for ESBL, ESBL producing uh, E. coli bacteria. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. 94% of chicken fillets just in the shops is positive on ESBLs. And 35% of human isolates had chicken ESBL gene, so there uh, seems to be a, an overlap there. And 19% of those isolates, of human isolates, were were not to be, disting to be distinguished from, from chicken isolates. So there is some reason to, th to, to pay attention to, uh, to that. We started off with uh, MRSA. I'm not going to talk a lot about MRSA, but show you some slides that we, uh, on work that we did in the past. You, you probably know that there are different types of MRSA, the hospital-associated types and the community or livestock-associated types. And all the isolates that were, uh, uh, were found in pigs and in pig farmers were MLST-398, which is the livestock-associated strains. We did some studies on, on MRSA in, um, in dairy. 
it is uh, somewhere around 2004, 2005, I think, that we in our lab found the first MRSA that we uh, found, first time that we found it in, um, in milk. And we followed that up, and, and uh, one of my for former colleagues, Richard Olderiekering, did a nice study in those days where he, he identified all MRSAs that were found in, um, in milk. And there were, there were in those years, 2000, about two years, I think, between 2006 and 2008, there were some 60 herds that had one or more emerases, and generally that's two or th maybe three uh, emerases in, in milk. 60 of, of 28 of those 60 herds also had pigs on their farm, which delivered an odds ratio of 6.3. So if a, if a farm also had pigs, the, 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 the risk that... that um, that MRSA was found was, was, was six times higher than if there were no pigs on the farm. And the map of the, of the Netherlands that you see here, the yellow color indicates the number of pig farms that are there. And, uh, um, and that increases. So the darker the color, the more pig farms are there. And as you see, the eastern and the southern part of the country, that's where, where most pig farms are, are located. Whereas dairy farms are also located in the north and in the, in the southwest. What you see here is that the red dots that are the 60 farms of, or, or the, the farms that had, emer that had um, uh, cattle as, as well as pigs and the blue ones only had cattle. But all the blue herds where we found MRSA were mainly based in areas where there are many pigs. Anyhow, um, most interesting or more interesting maybe is that all the isolates that we found in dairy also were MLST 398, so the livestock associated types. So there seems to be quite a, there still is a problem. We have methicillin resistant Staph aureus, but it seems to be not related to the hospital associated types that are found in, uh, in people. Going on to ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactamase. It was for the first time identified in 1982 in a, in a Klebsiella pneumoniae um, in, in, in Germany. And nowadays, we have hundreds of different types of, uh, of ESBLs. We're talking about enzymes that are produced by uh, intestinal uh, bacteria, Enterobacteriaceae, and they are able to inactivate beta-lactam antimicrobials, which include the third and fourth generation cephalosporins. And as I said, there are many different types. Uh, we find we've different genes were were found to uh, that in that code for these enzymes, CT, CTXM1, CTXM2, a whole lot of numbers, TEM1, SHV, and also MC types of, um, uh, of ESBLs. Um, the, 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 the genes, the codes for producing these enzymes, these ESBLs, are based on DNA or also on plasmids, which is basically are free parts of DNA within the cell. And that's the, that's the risky thing of it, because these plasmids, they can transfer from, as you see on the picture, from donor bacteria to recipient bacteria. And by doing that, there may be a horizontal transmission of resistance um, within and between bacterial species. And you can imagine that through that approach or through that, through that way, um, antimicrobial resistance can spread much quicker than when it's only vertical. And on top of that, it's often multi-resistant, so you have more resistance genes on a plasmid, so the, it's much harder to, uh, uh, to beat these, uh, these bacteria. We didn't know a lot about ESBL and dairy when we started working in this field. Uh, we didn't know about the prevalence, we didn't know on number of positive herds nor number of positive cows, and um, we didn't know about the relation on antimicrobial use. Of course, there were uh, suspicions. Uh, we, we, they were suspected of to be um, relations, uh, as was also the case for the relation between veterinary use and human exposure. So this were, these were the questions that we tried to solve in this, in this work. We started off with uh, uh, finding the prevalence in herds. We took, um, as a very rough first estimate, um, a manure samples from the manure cellar, as you see on the picture, and compared um, uh, 100, 100 conventional herds with the idea that that's the standard use of antimicrobials in the country and 100 low users. And for the, uh, the latter category, we had 90 uh, organic herds and 10 
natural grazers. They were not dairy herds, but natural grazers. What we found was that in the conventional herds, 59 of them, so I'm talking about the manure cellars, 59 of them were negative, and uh, 41 were positive on either ESBL or MC. So 41% of the herds we found ESBL in the manure. When we went to the, to the low users, the organic and the natural grazers, it was, was, was much lower. If you um, cumulative, it's 12% of them were positive. We found 10 ESBL positive uh, manure samples in organic herds and two MC. So there was, there was a difference there. Next step that we did was that we went to individual cows and see to find out what, uh, what the difference was there. So of the ESBL positive conventional herds, we took um, uh, 10 uh, positive herds and 10 ESBL negative herds, and we sampled 24 individual cows on both uh, types of, uh, of herds. And that was half a year, approximately six months after the first sampling. And what we found was that in the, in the, in the originally ESBL positive herds, so the, the, the left part of the, of the table, six of them in the manure samples from the cellar, which we did again, had turned negative. Four of them were still positive, uh, and some, two of them, had changed from ESBL to MC types. Uh, in the originally negative herds, eight were still negative, whereas two turned positive. So apparently there's some change there. And then going to the individual animals, we found that in the, in the negative originally, or in the negative herds, originally positive but then turned negative, um, hardly any individual animals were positive. Um, whereas in the originally negative herds, that was the same, but also the number of positive animals was very low. So what you see here is that there were two herds, or, or basically four herds that had stayed positive over that period. And in two of them, all animals that we cultured were individually positive. And then remarkably enough, some were that on ESBL and others on, on MC. So it it's, feels like there's something spreading, maybe temporarily, in a herd. This was the first rough approach to have an indication of what was happening on ESBL in these, um, in these herds. So apparently there's more ESBLs in regular than in organic herds, or in conventional, if you like. There, uh, we also did a questionnaire on these herds. We looked at all kinds of management things. I'll, for the sake of time, I don't go into the details on what we all did. I just share my conclusions with you. But we found that there's more ESBL if people always treated all clinical mastitis cases with antimicrobials, either local or parenteral. Um, we also found that the total antimicrobial use in these herds was not related with the prevalence of ESBL, whereas the use of critical important antimicrobials is related to the prevalence of, uh, of ESBL. Um, critical important antimicrobials, what is that? We have a system in our country where there's first, second, and third preference antimicrobials, which means that you, as a first preference, use certain types of antimicrobials, and the third preference, which is the critically important antimicrobials, we try to use um, as, as little as possible. There really has, has to be a good reason for that, to use them. What you see here is those types of antimicrobials, th third, fourth generation, cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, long-acting macrolides, and polymyxin B and E, col cholestine, if you, um, if you like. And, um, uh, we found in our studies, I just showed you, that the use of that type of antimicrobials was related to ESBLs in those herbs. And we published that in Dairy Science two years ago or so. And that was not the first time the group of SNOW uh, published that in Preventive Veterinary Medicine in 2012 already. But we confirmed that. And ever since, there were many studies that showed that, uh, that relation. So what happened in our country was that the, the first, second preference type of antimicrobial use, as I just explained to you, um, uh, made a big change in the use of this type of antimicrobials. Ever since 2012, the use of uh, third and fourth generation cephalosporins in dairy herds decreased enormously, as you can see in this, um, in this graph. They're only allowed to use when there's no other choice, when there's no alternative, and when based on sensitivity testing, it has been shown that you really need them with the effect uh, that you see here. Okay, 
when we knew that, there still were a lot of questions to be answered on, on ESBL. We were interested whether that decrease that I just showed you, the decrease in use on these uh, third and fourth generation cephalosporins, also would have an effect on, e on the ESBL prevalence in, in our dairy herds. We found that the ESBL infections apparently seem to be temporary, that you find infections but that they appear and disappear in time, but we didn't know anything about uh, their dynamics. And we also didn't know anything about the age distribution of ESBL in cattle, whereas that was interesting because we find a lot of ESBL in, uh, in field calves, and as you know, these calves originally come from um, dairy herds. So what we, do, it, what we did was that in 2013, we did basically the same study again as in um, 2011, although we did it a bit bigger. We had uh, 183 dairy herds there, and we took originally or initially, I should say, the same sampling technique. We took manure samples from the cellar and to be able to compare that with the, with the earlier study. And we found that in 2011, that when we took exactly the same sampling method, some 33% of the herds were positive, whereas in 2013 that was 18%. And you see the confidence intervals at the screen. That was, uh, there was a trend of a decrease in that, uh, in that period. As you can see, the confidence interval of the 2013 study is a bit smaller than in 2011, which of course was due to the fact that we had more herds in that, uh, in that study. What we also did was that we took individual samples. We looked at, uh, at, uh, at we, we tried to sample as many young calves as possible um, until the age of 21 days uh, to take young stock, which was not always possible, but we did as many as we could because, of course, many young stock is in the field, and we sampled 15 individual calves from those, uh, from those herds. And then you can find different groups. You can find the different positive groups. The, the, the calves only can be positive, the young stock, the adult cows. And of course, you can also find two out of three that are positive or three out of three. And what we found is the following. This is in the sequence of, uh, of, of, of highest prevalence. 42% of the herds were not positive at all. 26%, 27% had only positive uh, uh, calves. And so on. And what you already see in this in this uh, little overview is that it's specifically the young stock that is uh, that is positive. If you add that up, you come to some 49 percent. So almost the half of the herds do have positive uh, calves, ESBL positive calves. Whereas in 15 percent of the herds, the young stock is positive, and 23 percent of the herds, the older cows are positive. And of course, I do realize that we had different numbers of animals in the different age groups for practical reasons, um, but this gives an indication on where you find most ESBLs, specifically if you look at the prevalence of the, uh, of the number of animals. Of the, of the uh, I think it's somewhere 750 or so calves that we tested, 33% was positive on ESBL, where it was 2% of the young stock, and 1% of the individual cows, if you add them all up um, together. Um, this is, a, this is a, a graph of the, of the young calves until three weeks of age. It were seven, well, as I said, seven, 748 calves, and that's, say, like 30 or so per, per day in the different, uh, different days of age. Um, and you, you don't see much, uh, much change here. The original idea that we had was that if it was uh, lower in older animals, it might be, might be high at the start and then slowly decrease, but we didn't find that. During the first three weeks, well, as you see here, it seems more or less stable. I'll get back to that with a little more detail uh, later in my presentation. So, um, ESBLs in young calves. There's a, there's a higher prevalence than in, uh, than, in, uh, than in older animals, but we didn't see a significant decrease during the first uh, three weeks. Question is, when do they get affected? And does antimicrobial use in young calves play a role in that? Talking about antimicrobial use in animals, and I've talked about that in Dublin, there's a couple of, of, of uh, touchy points in dairy, which is dry cows, which is the, the critical important antibiotic, but also young stock. 
because we use so little antimicrobials in dairy, because we deliver milk, and um, that is sort of an internal driver for farmers not to use too much antimicrobials. Where that is not the case in young stock, because they don't deliver milk. So does, do, does antimicrobial use play a role, or antimicrobial residues play a role in the high ESBL prevalence in young calves? First thing that you think of is the use of, uh, of waste milk. Um, we don't know exactly how much that is in our country. There was a study from Randall from the United Kingdom where they described that some 83% of the herds in the United Kingdom feed waste milk and microbial, uh, so, so potentially uh, milk with potentially antimicrobials residues in it to their calves. And there was one report, a governmental report in our country, that some 10% of herds in our country use waste milk to feed their bobby calves, their bull calves. I don't know whether that's true, yes or not. My, my, my feeling is that that's an underestimation, but I, I don't know. We don't have data on that. The study of, uh, of Randall, uh, which was published in, in Research in Veterinary Science, is, uh, is a very detailed study on, on this effect and is uh, worth uh, describing here. What they did is that they followed up some uh, 120 herds, had a bit over 100 waste milk samples, where they found um, in 66 of them antimicrobials, penicillin G, cefquinone, and where they found in almost all herds enterobacteriaceae positive um, uh, 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 animals, of which a limited number of seven was ESBL positive. Again, here, the highest or the most important risk factor was the use of critical important antimicrobials, cefquinone. They found an odds, rate, uh, an, odds, odds, uh, an odds rate of 14 if cefquinone was used on the farm, and if cefquinone was found in the waste milk, the odds ratio was uh, 24. They then followed up three of the positive herds, where they found um, uh, calves to be up to 75% of them being ESBL positive. Well, in our country, based on the whole discussion on antimicrobials, there was somewhere they found a law that it is forbidden to, to give waste milk to calves, which made it virtually impossible for us to study it, to find people that did it and participate, etc., etc. So we didn't do any work on, on waste milk, but I think this paper is, uh, is informative enough. What we did work on was um, the potential effect of antimicrobial residues through colostrum. Um, are there antimicrobial residues? And do they have an effect on ESBL in those young calves? Um, so we did a, we did a pre to start off, we did a prevalence study in 180 herds where we, where we included one cow per herd and we asked farmers to, to take milk samples of the first cow that was, uh, that was calving after the start of the study that had been dried off with antimicrobials, any that they at that time used in their farm. And we asked them to take four quarter samples and we pooled that later on and then we did a microbiological analysis of that colostrum uh, sample and we did an LCMS to test whether or not there were antimicrobials in, um, in that. Um, the animals in the study were, were dried off with different types of antimicrobials, beta-lactam anti antimicrobials, or a combination of aminoglycosides and beta-lactams. And here you see the results. It's uh, three quarters of them, 75% were only treated with beta-lactams, and 25% with a combination. And that could be either cloxacillin, um, ampicillin, neomycin, or streptomycin in different, uh, in different combinations. Looking at the residues that we found in, uh, in colostrum, um, we found that, uh, that, that of, the, of the cows that were dried off with beta-lactam dry cow treatments, 50 out of the 88 were positive on residues. And you see the details on the, on the, on the, on the table there. And uh, remarkably enough, of the cows that were dried off with beta-lactams in two, two of them, there were also aminoglycosides found which is remarkable, of course, because it hadn't gone in there, and apparently something went wrong in the administration of, uh, of the farmer. We asked them which type of antibiotic had been used, and apparently um, this is not correct for some reason, or they had been treated with other 
uh, aminoglycosides. We don't know that. You, would, you wouldn't expect that, but this is the data um, the way they are. So 57% of the better lactam dried off cows, we found residues in the colostrum, and 83% uh, of the combination treated cows, which were a little bit less. In those days, there were still combinations used. Nowadays, that's, it's only better lactam, basically. So yes, we did find quite some uh, residues there. Next question, of course, is how much was it? How much, uh, what, what was the, 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 the quantitative, the, 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 the amount of antimicrobials in the colostrum? And here you see the data, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but the interesting thing here is the, the median and the average concentration in, uh, in, in uh, milligrams per, per, per kilogram as compared to the MRL, which is in the, in the what is it, one, two, three, fourth um, uh, column. And then you see that in, uh, in, in the cloxacillin, in 70% of the, of the cows, uh, the value was above MRL, and in, uh, in ampicillin, that's uh, 38%. This is the first colostrum, so the first milk that we have from the, from the cow. Um, which means that that is within the withdrawal time that is indicated by the, by the companies that sell these dry cow antibiotics. So those withdrawal times have to be respected. And there are not many people that deliver a colostrum to a, to a milk plant, so that normally is, would be good, except that the withdrawal time doesn't go for the calf, because as we all know, the calf does need colostrum for reasons, and apparently, in quite a number of cases, if cows are treated with antimicrobials, there are above MRL levels of antimicrobials there. Um, we had uh, some collateral findings. One that you can imagine is that the length of the dry period has an effect on the amount of, of antimicrobials that you find in the, in the colostrum. Uh, every day longer, there's a decrease in positive findings of, of one or two. We made three, three groups here, less than 42 days. It's 72% positive, between 44 and 62. It's 64%, and over 62 days, it's 52%. So the longer the dry period, the less antimicrobial you find, and that's, well, what you would, uh, would expect. Another interesting uh, collateral finding that we, we didn't expect was the effect of internal teeth sealants. If internal teeth sealants are used, we find less antimicrobial residues in, uh, in the colostrum. And our, our idea was that maybe due to, to, to drawing out the sealant, you draw away the, the, the antimicrobial residues in the first colostrum. And I'll get back to that in a minute. We tested that hypothesis, which wasn't found to be, to be true. But there was quite an effect of that internal T sealant. It's not totally significant. Number of cases is not that high, but uh, there was a trend um, towards that. Okay, even more questions about ESBLs. We, we, we made little steps forward. Um, next question was how much antimicrobial is consumed through, through those residues in colostrum, and what would be the effect of that consumption? We did a pilot study, quite a lot of work, so it's difficult to have very many animals, but we did a pilot study, 22 cows that were dried off with cloxacillin. By that time, the, the, the indication of dry cow antibiotics had changed a little bit, so the combination dry cow therapies went out and we went to, to, to mainly first preference uh, antibiotics. We sampled the animals for seven milkings with, with, with specific attention to the first, uh, the first milk, as I just indicated, because of our hypothesis on the internal teeth sealants. Um, so we had separate tw the first 25, 50, 70, 25, 25, 25 ml of colostrum. And we did an antimicrobial uh, 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 analysis of that, and we quantified the antimicrobial consumption of, of those animals based on what we found and the weight of the, of the colostrum and, uh, and the colostrum consumption of those, uh, of those calves. Um, well, the hypothesis on the internal teeth sealant wasn't, wasn't found to be true. There was only one of the of the 22 cows that, that was positive in the first 75 ml, whereas it was negative in the rest of the first, uh, of the first milking. There were six that where the concentration actually was higher in the first 75 ml 
and lower in the rest of the first milking, and 15 of them it was the opposite. So the idea to maybe withdraw the first 75 or 100 or so uh, ml to get rid of the antimicrobial residues, that, that didn't work. How it does work with the internal T-cellum, we don't know, but there still is a nice hypothesis to, uh, to test there. Um, this is what we found in residues. Um, the cloxacillin concentration on the, on the y-axis and the number of, uh, of milkings or the milking order on the x-axis. And as you can see, the, there is a strong reduction over the first few milk, milkings in the cloxacillin concentration. It is below MRL from the third milking on. Um, so by the time the milk is, is uh, going to be normal milk again and not colostrum, it will be, there will be no antibiotics there. That will not be, uh, be, the, be the problem. And we calculated, we estimated the total amount of cloxacillin consumed by the calves to be 0.34 milligram. 0.34 milligram. That's not much antibiotic. But that doesn't mean it cannot induce um, resistance. But that's what we, what we estimated. So the next thing was to evaluate the effect of that on the calves. So we found, we made uh, cow-calf combinations. We had 87 of them in, uh, in this study. 29 of these cows were not dried off with uh, antimicrobials, and 58 of them were. And of course, some of them will have residues in their colostrum, 36 in this, in this case, and some of them will not have residues in their colostrum, and that was 22. Um, what we did was that we, uh, we, we evaluated the samples on antimicrobial residues again, uh, the colostrum, and we looked at ESBLs in the colostrum itself and also in the calves at day one, day seven, and day four, 14 after, after birth. And we did that in a quantitative, in a quantitative um, way in, those, uh, in the animals. So this is our findings. 44% of the calves were ESBL positive at some point, so that's irrespective of the antimicrobial use or of the dry cow antibiotic use. And the prevalence of ESBL was significantly higher at day seven and day 14. It was 12% of the first day animals were positive and it was up to 35, 38% uh, at one or two weeks um, later. And when you look at the, at the level of shedding of ESBL, that also increased. Um, five of the animals, 6%, at the first day were high shedders, and um, at day 7 and 14 it was, uh, well, 18, 27%, 27, 18%. So not only the percentage, not only the prevalence of positive animals increased, also the level that they shed uh, ESBL. Comparing cows that were dried off with uh, cloxacillin dry cow antibiotics and without, we didn't find a difference in ESBLs in, uh, in the calves, 45 and 41%. Comparing cows that did have cloxacillin uh, residues in their colostrum and that did not have residues in the colostrum, there also was no significant difference, 49 versus 40%. So, yes, we do find a difference, we do find an effect, but no, we could not find an effect on uh, ESBLs in, um, in the calves. No significant effect of the use of dry cow antibiotics on the prevalence, nor on the shedding. I didn't show the numbers, but also on the level of ESBL shedding in the young calves. Um, we did find, we again had a collateral finding, is that the cows that were fed with colostrum with a higher total coliform count were less often positive on ESBL MC producing E. coli. And what was the basis of that? I'm unable to tell you at this time, maybe in a few years, but that's one of the remaining, uh, re remaining questions that we, uh, that we have. Another thing that we currently are looking at is uh, what's the effect of that of, that, uh, of those uh, cloxacillin residues and penicillin resistance in, in staphylococci. That may be a thing there too, that if you have very low um, uh, uh, antimicrobial levels in that milk for a long time, what the effect would that be on, uh, on Stavarius or other staphylococci? Okay, uh, I'm going to the end of my talk. Um, important question here is the veterinary use of 
uh, antimicrobials and the human exposure. I told you already a little bit about MRSA at the start of my talk, but there's a lot of discussion on that on ESBLs too, and for a reason, as I showed you at the start. If you look at, uh, at the internet, you find all kinds of, of, of pictures like this one on the, on the relation between antimicrobials, antibiotics in animals and in humans and the effect of that. In our country, as I explained in Dublin and also a little bit at the beginning of this talk, antimicrobial use was really in the spotlight. And there was uh, a lot of things done in, 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 in dairy, for instance, in cattle, I should say. I showed you this graph already, and the use of critical antibiotics already decreased. Um, that is different in other uh, species, in, in humans. What you see here is the cephalosporin use in, in hospitals. In the period where that decreased enormously in animals, it increased in hospitals. And I don't blame them because there's a reason for that. We're talking about, about intensive care, hospitals, that kind of things. Um, so people don't have an alternative. Um, but there is an increase in hospitals, in, 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 in the university, in large teaching hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. Where we see, where we, we are monitoring in our country pretty detailed antimicrobial resistance and talking about cattle, um, well, here you see the data on antimicrobial resistance in beef over the, the years that I'm talking about. And, uh, well, at, le at least there's not an increase. This is in, in veal. Veal has a, I already said that uh, some 10, 15 minutes ago, veal is a different, different ball game as compared to water uh, uh, cattle. There's a higher antimicrobial resistance there, but there seems to be a decrease there. Dairy, that's, uh, that's more or less the same. There was an increase in the years before the critical uh, antimicrobial use decrease, um, uh, was, was decreased, but it's at a low level now. Whereas in humans, the antimicrobial resistance increased over those years. Again, I'm not blaming them, but I'm sort of comparing on what's the effect of what you, what's going on in animals and in, um, in humans. We had a huge study, and I'm going to finish up with, uh, with that, on um, veterinary use and human exposure, specifically on ESBL. Um, you see a, a whole bunch of authors here. That's how it goes with these, uh, with these studies. A national overview study on, from 2005 to 2015 in our country, in which some 35 studies were included, some um, 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 27,000 samples, like 5,000 ESBL isolates and 1,000 replicants of, of MC, that type of, uh, of study. And uh, the general conclusion was, or what, what was done in this study, was that the, the resistance types of ESBLs were compared between the different um, sources. There were, what is it, 22 different sources here, and this is a principal component analysis, and what you see here on the, on the left-hand side is the types of, uh, of, uh, of sources that are, that are there. And uh, oh, there it goes. The H is talking about humans. The E is environment. The F is food. And the A's are animals. And what you see here is there's basically a group of poultry here that's together. This is the humans. And the general population was found ESBLs in general population was found to be more related to, to clinical samples from humans than to, 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 to chicken or to other animals. This is the group of, 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 um, of, of dairy, of pigs. And what you see here is also that pig farmers or people working, that is called the, the pig farming community, people working with pigs are related to ESBLs in pigs. And people working in poultry are related to ESBLs in poultry, but not the general public. So there is also, like in MRSA, a different population. The conclusion of that study was that, uh, that there were distinguishable transmission cycles in different hosts, and there's not a, 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 a linkage between the ESBL MC genes in, uh, in livestock farming and the people in the general population. OK, I'll finish up with throwing some conclusions at you. Um, yes, there was, there is maybe in some countries an overuse of antimicrobials in farm animals, including in cattle. And yes, there is a relation between antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance 
in, in animals, in cattle. I showed you one example. There apparently is a relation, um, and it has been proven in many different studies. Yes, you can uh, decrease, and it has been done in some countries, antimicrobial use without negative consequences for animal health and welfare. It's a challenge, but it can be, it can be done. And a linkage between antimicrobial use in animals and in humans could so far not be demonstrated. But animal health itself and the potential effect of antimicrobial use in animals on human health are important enough to practice prudent antimicrobial use. And that is what I would like you to take home as a message. I'd like to end up with uh, stating that we would like to organize this conference in 2024 in Utrecht, and we'll have a bid on that in two years in, uh, in Spain. And I'd like to invite you to a conference, a European conference for Europeans, but also for the rest of the world, in uh, Den Bosch, in Sertogenbosch, in September next year, which has the theme, Your Veterinary Toolbox in 2025. And all details can be found at this website. Thank you for your attention.